The theme of my talk tonight is the psychology of nature conservation and you. Now, most of the people start their talks by giving a map. And I just thought I should also give a map because this is as good as I can get with a map. So I'm talking to you from Pretoria. Pretoria in the southern tip of South Africa. And this is a Google map uh, image of Africa and part of the world. And here I've been sitting uh, since the 10th of March, probably in the same chair, seven days of the week. So that's my map to locate my conservation spot for now. Um, when I talk about Pretoria, I also talk about my personal life. And this is a photo of my two brothers and myself, me being in the middle. And uh, we are five siblings. And um, the only reason why I put this photo on is because I think this is the first and the last photo of me where I think I look cute. So that's why I put on this photo. So if I drop dead tonight, please, this is what you should remember and keep in your mind, this cute little boy. I do want to share two things about my childhood. Uh, the first of, of which is that I can say tonight that I cannot remember a single time in my life ever that my parents took us into nature, taught us anything specifically about nature, wildlife, anything of the kind. I know that as a family, we once had a picnic um, about five kilometers from our home in a place called the Fountains, and it was rather disastrous. That was my experience that I can remember as a child that um, I had, but my parents were not into this at all. Second thing I would like to say about my childhood is that I, I was not a particularly emotionally happy child. Um, I enjoyed playing. I took to the streets, but I also know that I was not necessarily and particularly happy. But do look at uh, on my chest here, I attached a little slingshot. Man, was I good shooting with this little sling. And we could shoot and hit any target. And I had a friend with the name of Moritz Ruth, and him and Richard Hussey and myself, who's also on tonight, we played together as little boys. Moritz, he, Moritz's parents were hunters. And Moritz, same age as us, taught us to hunt, but always hunt for the pot. So we went into open areas and then we would shoot birds. And then we would go and, like we say in Afrikaans, cook or bry those little birds. I can remember one very specific moment in my life when I was five years old, when Moritz's parents invited me to join them when they went hunting in the Blyde River area. And we spent five days there. And please look at the green, the, the, the green screen here. I'm going to every now and then refer to the green screen. And I do want to say that in my childhood memory, these five days in nature were most likely, most probably five of the happiest days that I experienced. And I can remember that when I went back to school, being a rather active little boy, the one teacher said to me at a point that he could see some change in my behavior. And that change in behavior was affected by this five days that I spent in nature. Like everybody else, 
we had to go to the military in South Africa. We were to a certain extent indoctrinated because everything was built around apartheid. When you look at the left-hand photo, I was 18, 19 years old here. Went to the artillery and we were trained to kill. That was what it was about. I then later moved on into military intelligence and I must admit that I excelled in the military simply because I enjoyed the physical side of things and I was rather active. And with that as background, I remember another very particular incident. We all had to go into what we call, call the border wall. And I spent a lot of time in the border during that time. And these are the typical scenes that one would see. And I know that I was particularly, particularly unhappy. And I really battled and struggled that particular time. I think I weighed 65 uh, kilograms and I lost 15. Green photo. Look at the green photo. And I do remember, despite the terrible circumstances, that a lot of those soldiers and my friends would say to me, look at nature. And they found their solace in nature during a war. Nature touched them, regardless of the fact that it was an unjust war, young boys in there, and they found their solace through nature. The military had quite a big impact on me, and I gradually became more and more religious. And I then decided to go and study theology. Years 10 of my friends, with our favorite professor, and we like to call ourselves the off-whites, simply because all the other guys were lily white, and we a little bit off-white. But during that time at university, I was still in the military. And I had to chase those who were in the anti-conscription campaign. And my job was to find out who's doing what in the anti-conscription campaign to bring apartheid to an end. And then a miracle happened in my life. And I met three people, actually just met the middle guy, uh, Peter Moll on the left, Charles Yates, his cousin on the right, Richard Steele. Peter Moll was jailed for a year as a pacifist, refusing to join a three-day military shooting exercise. I met with Peter clandestine undercover when he was in the jail, him not knowing what my background is. And this man convinced me of the unjust war we are involved and I left the ministry and I moved uh, the military and I moved on into the ministry, taking a big jump. So I became a pastor within Kruger National Park. And if you look at these photos here, this is the Marae children sitting at the entrance at Skakuza and uh, where the statues of the founders were. And here I am involved in one of the churches we started with 19 denominations, and this organization was called the Shlanganu Vararanzu Ravano Vashikwendu. And here I am as a pastor with my friend Hitler Matabula. And here I am in nature in Kruger Park. It just so happened that I landed there, just as it is. But look at green photo, nature. I know how much nature touched me during the time that I was there. Then something very specific happened, and I cannot, and for ethical reasons, not use any names. Thanks to my friend Carl Lawrence, Hugh Stevens, and Jim Presley, who actually put these photos in the last two weeks this, these photos were taken on the 5th of July. I asked them to try and just create an ambiance so people could understand. One of our colleagues 
was an ex-military guy. Sam Parks made a big effort of appointing military people because it's international border, both Mozambique in the east and the north, Zimbabwe. But Mozambique was also at war, a civil war between Renamo and Frelimo. And this particular friend carried very, very serious emotional problems due to trauma experience on the border, at the border war. One caused by himself, atrocities that he committed, and the other that happened to him. And everybody said to me, you got to talk to this guy. We need to help this guy. And he refused. So one Friday afternoon, he arrived at my house and he said, come, tonight we are talking. And it was full moon. And that particular night, we went up a little hill, which you will see now. It's called Renosta Hill or Renosta Copies. And this is what it looks like at full moon. Thank you, Karo and Jimmy, Jimmy, for taking these pictures. But this is what it looks like. There's no flash here. You can see everything full moon. And my friend took me up to this particular hill, which is um, the Renosta copies, and we were sitting there. And as we sat there, he asked me to keep quiet. And he made me keep quiet for more than an hour. And I became incredibly deeply aware of a human integration with nature. And for my first time in my life, I felt totally one with nature. And then my friend said to me after an hour, he said to me, this is where I find my solace. This is how I overcome my terrible traumatic memories. And then he said to me, and do you now want to talk to me about God? And I kept quiet because there was nothing to say. Nature already spoke to us. Green photo, green frame. Nature touches the soul of man. During this period, there was the civil war in Mozambique between Renamo and Frelimo. My friend Carl Lawrence, who's also on tonight, we started some work in this area. Children in their hundreds came out of the bushes, no parents, nobody to look after them. They were just poor kids who lost their parents and they tried to keep them together. This was right at the beginning when we started with some or some humanitarian, uh, humanitarian aid, um, including feeding programs and also medical support. Numbers grew more and more. It's important for me to just share this with you. Here we are trying to get some water through into this area. Our children were part of it all the time. They went with us all the time. They saw the suffering of the people. The military and uh, foreign affairs and the police eventually created a gate. And I had freed them to go in and out into Mozambique. The soldiers from time to time fetched me and others, and we went in there. Robbie Green, who was very part of it, is also on the show tonight. And we tried our best to help these people. They came to me and they asked me whether I would christen the children. The majority of these people were Roman Catholics. And in the Roman Catholicism, the christening of a child is very important because that also, if a child dies um, and not being christened, then my understanding is that that child cannot get eternal life. And they asked me to christen them. And I decided, well, if I then become a Roman Catholic priest, being a Protestant, so be it, but this needs to happen. There was a row of people probably, probably a kilometer long. And they brought these kids. Why? Because they were dying. And this little baby here, if I'm not mistaken, died about two weeks after she was christened. 
long row of people, and here's Hitler's Matabula, who helped us in the process, and Robbie Green in this process. Just trying to say that it was so severe, many people died, and we saw the suffering of people in a big way. The military strategist of Renamu was a guy called General Vera. And at a certain point, he wanted to meet with us. And four of us here, Robbie, myself, Carl Lawrence, Jan van Frieden, we were taken by the soldiers into Mozambique. They had to lead and guide us because of landmines. General Vera is not visible on the phone. He was not allowed to be made visible. And we had meetings with General Vera. And General Vera created the fame of friendship. And General Vera shared with us even personal things. General Vera, from time to time, would meet with me and I would have discussions with him. And what was incredible is that there were three journalists looking for General Vera. They wanted to meet him. And I still remember their names very well. And uh, they came and they to me and they asked me, can they meet with me? And I organized for them to meet with me. And the, the one guy, Eddie Koch, together with guys like David Fig and people from the group for environmental monitoring, they actually started the concept of peace sparks, sparks across boundaries so that war-ridden people can come to peace through nature. And when they asked General Vera, when will the war end? Vera said to them, soon. And they asked why. And he said, well, I met these friends of mine. And I've seen how things can change. And when they asked him about his opinion about conservation and peace parks, he said, Nature will change us all. And so in 1992, the peace agreement was signed between Renamo and Frelimu. And again, here's our children and everybody. And we were celebrating peace, which I think also came through the process of natural healing through nature. Because these people and children who could not even sing and dance started growing through these processes. So, in short, from a psychological perspective, and when I talk about nature, um, there are a number of schools of thoughts around nature. There's the hypothesis of biophilia, bio being biodiversity and filia is the love for the biodiversity, uh, which refers to our innate need to affiliate with nature. And that's because the hypothesis is it is genetical, because we, through years and natural selection, selection those who lived close to nature understood nature were the ones that survived. And my own experience through years of doing post-traumatic stress disorder counseling, people deeply, deeply traumatized. My, my experiential experience was that, again, exposure to nature healed the soul of people. And there's a school of environmental psychology now in the days that's a growing discipline. Um, that and the principle is basically that the restoration of the soul also comes through the joining with and becoming part of nature. Um, we all know that at the moment there are a lot of young people who suffer from eco anxiety because of climate change and their lack of vision for the future. It is at the moment. Uh, people are considering whether this um, uh, problem of eco-anxiety should become part of the Diagnostical and Statistical Manual for Mental Disorders. Fact is, even our 
fear around things like the climate change are causing people to become anxious because we are again linked into nature and we can also go and get study and look at the result of people who are not in touch with nature whether it's the imbalance of people who live in slums or urbanized people or most wealthy people digital generation who's lost the touch with nature it's very clear that the human psyche is very very closely linked to nature and some studies were done uh, around people who are mindful and connected to nature and there were some psychological measurement scales developed and look at this direct correlation where there's mindfulness and connectedness to nature there was an increase in terms of the intrinsic aspirations of people they because they were connected to nature looked at personal growth people connectedness generosity care care also for nature and to be part of nature and a decrease of this intrinsic aspirations for money for fame for boosting one's own image again just simply saying that when there is a mindfulness and a connectedness to nature then one one's behavior start changing and here's an example and when i do this i don't know if you can see me on the screen i'm putting this hat on so this person here jansen I think his name was Janssen Janssen and a group of people from the peacekeeping forces at the time when we went through the transformation uh, into democracy. A lot of these people came to where we were working and a lot of these people did this willingly. They were not part of this program and all of them asked us to come to where we stay and they would stay for a weekend to be in nature the mindfulness and then willingly go out and connect and help these people the head of the SABC came over and over to come and stay there for weekends and to come and work in nature with these people and show their connectedness i will not forget when i'll be sex anti-apartheid activist who lost his arm in a car bomb because of the apartheid uh, regime um, then later became a judge of the constitutional court he was in kruger with me and we were driving one night on the night drive and i apologized to him and i said we have not seen many animals or we're not seeing many animals and he just said to me i just want to be at peace in nature because it was a very very difficult time this time of transition at peace in nature green slide nature touching the soul of man so providence moved and life moved on and i started working for south african national parks and later the lca leadership for conservation in africa was formed and i had various roles and in hindsight most of my roles even till today is to act very much as a change agent there was a very difficult time when the trail rangers who are basically conservation trained people who worked in the department of conservation and the interpreters the interpretive services people uh, colleagues who had to interpret nature for people when they were put under the department of tourism and i was asked to manage this quite difficult situation because the identity was taken away from them to become tourist officials something that they despise and then around 92 93 94 i was asked to start spearheading the community lays and social ecology department 1993 and work in these communities which i was used to doing around the mozambican area and we started with the community liaison and at the time minister derek hamner come put some people in my office to keep the pressure on so that we could move 
And he said, if we do not change, they will cut the fences and they will chase the cattle into Kruger Park. Very, very difficult times. And as an organizational psychologist, I then later worked for Sand Parks as part of the organization development of Sand Parks. And in Sand Parks, we started the Leadership for Conservation in Africa. And uh, in the last year and a half, I will, uh, was also the interim CEO for the Sabina Platinum Africa Charities that focuses on environmental education. So the LCA's vision is to positively influence, accelerate, and bring about the protection of rainforests and selected ecosystem in, in sub-Saharan sub Africa. When we designed this vision, my thoughts were all the time about positively influence, accelerate, bring about. The question is what to accelerate, what to bring about. And this is now my map. And in these 20 countries, I have worked at many, many levels with many conservation people, NGOs, ministerial people, state presidents, and with the local people, the poorest of poor on the ground. Another learning school that happened where I had to fill the space in which I landed. So when we talk about nature conservation, what would you define as the purpose of nature, nature conservation? Is it biodiversity management? Is it planning for the future? Is it to uh, create a situation of understanding so there could be a balance between human needs and on the other side, what nature has to offer? I'll leave that decision and the definition for you to decide for yourself. On the other side, I unfortunately also saw the biggest and learn about the biggest sin of conservation. And this is a sad part, but at the same time, I want to say there are so many brilliant people out there, wonderful people who are really trying their utmost. But I think one of the biggest sins of conservation is the sin of alienation. It comes from Hegel, the philosopher, and uh, simply saying the inevitable result when that which is intrinsic, um, sorry, I can't see here, uh, intrinsic to the existence of man is reduced to a mere object. Karl Marx also discussed the principle of alienation, so did um, Nietzsche, so did Feuerbach. And what Karl Marx, how he explained it, he said that if you, for instance, alienate a person from their intrinsic interests and love for work, and you force them to do work in factories where they become mere objects, then people lose that identification with that institution and organization. And I really got to understand this, and I'm saying this very carefully. So when two of us went to the European Union and we met with people there and in the European Union, that particular person who played a very senior role there said to us that he will, say, he will call us liars if we, we say this publicly. But his sole total vision was to get rid of people in and around parks. He hated the concept of tourism. I do understand that as a purist, he wanted to protect nature for what it is. And then strangely, after that, I had a meeting with a person, sorry, I'll go back there, um, in conservation. And I asked him, but why is he unhappy? And he said, why should I thank you as what you are doing? You are doing for self-interest. If we are, as conservationists are doing things for self-interest, 
then we are opposing this alineation. These are just photos, photos of communities, poor of the poor people, young children li living in urbanized areas trying to make a living. And on the other side, a soldier, AK-47, a massive helicopter. Now, let me put this straight out. I have no problem with anti-poaching. I have no problem with law enforcement. Leon Lambrecht, you sitting there in Zakuma in TAD, and you're going to do a talk, I, I, I trust. And Ria Labeskachny, you can go and listen to his talk about what they had to do in Chad. There is place for law enforcement. I just think that we should always ensure that we do not cause alineation through our actions. Look at this alineation. This is the beauty that a lot of us are used to. And look at the situation of people living in slums, this alineation. So I said the biggest sin of conservationists, I think sometimes the whole sin of entitlement, unwavering purism, elitism, exclusivism. Start with myself. It was a time, and I think it still is, because we struggled with our own egos. We were right. We knew the best. Rangers who know the best, and there's nobody better and higher than a ranger. And a ranger can tell you what to do and not to do. Researchers doing research for the sake of doing research, and scientists doing science for the sake of science. Understand me correctly again. Nothing wrong with science. But we also have to distinguish between science and scientists and ornithologists who could not but just give us all the wealth of the knowledge and tourist managers who knew better than anybody else and conservation organizations. Nobody will tell them what to do, living on their own islands, alienating others, departmental leaders and politicians. I think this is one of the biggest sins of conservation. We are very much to blame for a lot of the problems that we also face, because very often it's me in the center, us, my organization, and everything must focus on that, where we, the conservationists of the world, should be in the center, pulling towards, going towards those who are on the outside and get others to become part of all this. So what's the reality, the context of the planet that we are in now, and why the psychology of nature uh, conservation is needed? In the context that we are now, we are looking, um, we are looking at, uh, at climate change, actually climate crisis. We are looking at the elephant in the room, overpopulation. Not such an easy thing just to address, but serious, massive problem. We are looking at CO2 emissions. And this is the context in which we are living with a massive overpopulation. And we are the conservationists, and we need, want to do something about that. So my five lessons on the psychology of conservation. My point of departure is only people can do conservation. Just think about it. If there are no people on this planet, there's no problem, there's no evil. Nature will go its way. But people are the only ones with this brain power to be able to do conservation. But when we do conservation, then it's by people for people, as Mother Nature grounds and roots people. So the, the object of conservation is actually people. The methodologies that we use to be able to influence people, to influence their mindsets, to bring this green photos into their lives, where people can actually be touched by nature. 
that is what conservation should be focusing on, is the people. Because we have landed in a situation of total in, uh, uh, imbalance and with no equilibrium. Secondly, turn your expertise towards recreation. There's a wonderful book written by Holmes Ralston III, Philosophy Gone Wild. And I adjusted his series a little bit, but we spoke about alineation. And on the alineation side, we know what happens when we alienate people from nature. Because our souls, our beings are linked to nature. And we know what happens in the cities and the slums. And with those who are so computer focused, that they've lost touch with that reality. On the other side, Ralston Free says, we can do a lot through recreation, where people stay and spend time in the forest, walking, running, canoeing, doing recreational activities in nature. But the final aim and the big aim about conservation, why we set so a land aside, why we have these protected areas is to lead people into re slash creation, where a sense of beauty is developed, where we can become who we are, part of creation, and see ourselves as part of creation and not alienated from creation. So this what we call sense of beauty, sense of place. What Ralston actually says is that when we move towards the recreation side, we take man out of the center and man becomes part of the ecosystem, part of nature, where when we alienate the lineation side, man becomes the center but no longer part of. I think it was Luther who said, um, man is the crown of God's creation. And by that, we started thinking that we are not nature. We are above nature, but we are nature. We are in nature. But because of our alienation of nature, we are now the ones in the cages. We are emotionally caged. And we are lost within ourselves because this freedom where we are part of nature is no longer there. And what Ralston actually says is not just sense of place and sense of beauty, but sense of proportion. What is the proportion of us to this little planet of ours? And the other way around, what is my size? as an individual, as part of um, this biosphere we call planet. What is my little place and, and spot? And suddenly I'm not that important. Suddenly I'm part of something very big. And that's towards which conservation should be work, working, is to create that involvement and that sense of proportion. Point three, the key is relationship and bridge building. My job as a conservation, whether I'm a ranger, a researcher, a scientist, you name it, is the bridge building of knowledge, of pulling and drawing people in to touch, to feel, and to find their equilibrium within nature. So is my job. As an alternative conservationist, economist, a teacher, a bookkeeper, a chef, a lawyer, a student, a teacher, a teenager, a sportsman, a woman. As conservation is a multifaceted and multidisciplinary management system. Conservation cannot just exist out of these people here. Every one of us is a conservationist. Every one of us have a role to play in this multifaceted and multidisciplined management system. 
I want to invite you to go and listen to the talk again of Dave Pepler, uh, Beyond COVID-19, where he refers to what is conservation, what is science, and there's so much to learn. But I think this, what I referred to earlier, earlier, this elitism as if only those who carry the necessary degrees and qualifications hold certain positions are the ones who are doing the conservation. We are the conservationists. So I remind you, when you are mindful and connected to nature, then the increased intrinsic aspirations start developing. Personal growth, people connectedness, generosity, care for, decrease intrinsic aspirations, money, fame, boosting own image, start disappearing. The touch with nature and all of us working together in this one system also changes people, their minds, their hearts, their lives. Point four, nature is the classroom of life and rejuvenation, education and multiplication is vital. People don't know what they don't know and knowledge in power. But the problem is that we have not really reached out to rejuvenate, to educate the young people. And not just to do that for our sake, but to do that for their sake. And I maintain if you're a conservationist, no matter where you are and what you do and where you work, but if you have a real heart for these kids, and if you, in their future is really your primary interest, then we as a conservation organization will rejuvenate as fast and as quickly as we can and educate and multiplicate what we are doing as fast and as quickly as we can. Thanks to Dave Pepler for this slide uh, referring to species area equation, which simply means that islands do grow. So each of us form a little island and if we make known what we are doing, sorry for that, and each one of us commit in our way to be part of nature and to live nature and share nature, then islands will start developing into continents and gradually and slowly we will turn the scale around. The last word, to each one of you who are actively involved in conservation. Uh, the situation we are in, climate change, climate crisis, overpopulation, and the problem that we have with CO2. This is the context in which we work. And uh, so I would like to remind you of Viktor Frankl, who lost his family stayed in Auschwitz as a Jewish psychiatrist. And the question is, how do you find purpose in a world like this? But when Frankl says, those who have a why to live can bear with almost any how. And the point is, if we know why we are doing this, it is people for people. It's people to reduce suffering for people. It's people to help people to bring balance in their own lives. That is the essence of conservation. And if you know why you are doing it, because you are changing and helping to change the lives of people to have a better way of living, then you have purpose. And I'm putting it in my own words. Frankl actually says, there's no purpose when you're in Auschwitz. Life actually doesn't have purpose. But when you have found purpose for your life, then life has purpose. And as conservationists, we have purpose. Don't give up. The purpose is people for people to create a better and balanced life for everybody. Ladies and gentlemen, I took this uh, 
photo in a little reggae bar in Ghana. What a long, strange trip it's been. It's been a long, strange trip. But then it says here, at this little end here, typical of a reggae bar, great, great food dead. I want to say I am grateful alive. And I'm grateful for many, many conservationists who are creating purpose and life, life and psychological existence, balanced psychological existence through touching nature for many others. Of course, I thank the LCA enablers, all our sponsors and people who help us to do the work that we are doing. And I thank many and lovely friends for helping us to do what we are doing. At the end, the psychology of nature is to bring people in touch and nature will heal. And we conserve so that these areas and wonderful Protected places can contribute to a balanced society. And you follow the purpose. And despite the critical state we are in, we have the courage to go on and go forward. I thank you all. Monsieur Rod Cassidy, I think it's time for questions and answers. Thank you, Mr. Chris Murray. That was that was awesome. And uh, you know, I've known you a very long time, and um, and we've uh, we've shared a lot of stories and a lot of journeys together. We've had a lot of time in exotic places like Bangui and Brazzaville, um, and. I learned a few things about you and I've learned a few more things about your philosophy, which has always been very inspiring to me. And I thank you very much for this talk. Thank um, you, Rod. You're an inspiration, Chris. Um, okay, we're going to open the floor to questions. Um, is there anybody who uh, would like to ask anything? Uh, Paul, if you can come in and help us here. Yeah? Yeah, I'm looking, um, but I just also want to say that, uh, Chris, you've always been an inspiration to me. And like what Rod said, um, I feel that I've known you now for 10 years, but I always learned something from you. I learned a great deal tonight, and you re-inspired me. And I learned some nice things about you as well. So thank you for that great talk, honestly, from my heart. Thank you, Paul. Now let's get to questions and answers. <laughs> Rod. Okay, any questions? We have Stephanie Klarman. Um, Stephanie, you're the first up. Hi, nice. thank you so much. Uh, Chris, I'd first like to say thank you so much for that really inspiring talk. It was so good to be able to hear somebody share some of the ideas I've actually been exploring in my own research. And I would love to know if it would be possible to maybe connect with you to chat about my doctoral research. Um, I'm also studying conservation psychology, so it's slightly different perhaps from um, environmental psychology. But from a conservation point of view, I'm really focused on how we can bring communities into conservation and bring back the grassroots approach so that it doesn't have such a a top-down feeling anymore. Um, so a lot of what you said hit home today, and I'd love to be able to connect with you. LCA.webinar at lcaafrica.org. Welcome, Stephanie. It's not <laughs> tonight. You, I'm going to drink wine after this session. Tonight. <laughs> I don't blame you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. I'll definitely be in touch. It would be wonderful to discuss your ideas. Um, and I'm also in Johannesburg, well, close enough to Pretoria. So it would, be, it would be lovely to be Stephanie, able to... Stephanie, next year we'll have you on to do a follow-up. Um, so you prepare your talk and we'll get you on oh. this time next year. Okay. <laughs> I'm in. I'm happily in. <laughs> Okay, bye-bye. Marty Jasper. Marty Jasper. I just wanted to say thanks, Chris, so much for that talk. The, 
uh, was such a authenticity and honesty. There was some stuff there that I'm sure was difficult to talk about, painful and not necessarily good memories, but um, I think learning and character building and um, you know, just how, you know, everything that you said, how nature, we are actually part of nature. Um, and when nature is removed from people, they, be, they don't, they remain not being people. Um, they actually start doing things that are um, inhumane to each other. And I think you know, that's just been my experience. So just thank you for that authenticity and honesty in your talk. It was brilliant. Thank you very much, Marty. Uh, we are students of, of, of our own lives and uh, learning as we go. And uh, now that I'm only 46 years old, I'm still le looking forward to learn much more. <laughs> but but yeah, you. I'd, li I'd like to meet you um, sometime soon, so yeah, we must try and connect. I don't have your cell phone number, so. Uh, no problem, Rod's got it. Just to <laughs> Rod, okay. <laughs> We'll Thank chat, you. Marty. Don't worry. Um, I don't see any hands coming up in the uh, in the participants uh, section. Uh, anybody wants to wave their hands around frantically because they don't know how to use it? Uh, Peter Turner. Peter Turner. Hi. Uh, mine wasn't really a question. I was just sort of kind of saying hi. But I mean, as always, Chris and I think from the early days of the LCA. Um, you know, really uh, our sincere appreciation for the work that you do and the influence that you've been and the spearhead that you've been in this wonderful organization. So well done, Chris. And, and, and again, a, a lovely chat and an inspiring talk tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. I think I should mention that Peter is officially called Nana Turner. And in the Ghanaian context, that means he's a tribal chief. And you don't just become a tribal chief. Um, so, Nana Turner, you have made your mark also working on a very, very local level with the people. So, thanks for coming from you. Much appreciated. Thank you. Anybody else have any more questions or any more comments? Um, Yippee. And, yeah. Seems to me I can go to bed early. Thanks. <laughs> Rod, can I quickly come in? Yes, please. Merit. We haven't applauded for Chris. Oh, no, we are caught at the end. <laughs> no, okay. <laughs> you can do well, I'm still here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, um, yeah, any more questions? Neil Schiff, you don't want to ask anything? Nobody else? Wave your hands or answer. Ah, Sibylle Guzman. Alles gut. Okay. So Ruben de Kock raised his hand. Hello, Sabil. Good evening. Hi, Chris. Um, no, thanks for a wonderful talk. Um, you touched on one of the issues later in your talk, and that is overpopulation uh, on this planet with humans. And I think that's one of the big issues if you want to get people back to connect to nature. It is so, so difficult if you have too many people. Um, and the areas that are still um, nature become less and less and less. Um, to me, that's been an issue for a long time. Uh, how, how can we do something about overpopulation? Um, even thinking about COVID, um, to me, this is just nature hitting back. Um, we are too many people, so disease will start and uh, it will decimate people, uh, which happens in, in nature, in animal populations. Um, so uh, uh, yeah, for me, that is, is a big problem. How can we reintroduce people to nature if we have too many people? Thank you, uh, Sabil. Very difficult question, easy question, difficult question to answer. Um, in the first place, I think we must um, be very open about this and straightforward that the human population, the numbers of people are simply too large. 
and this planet cannot carry this number of people. It's, mm. It is how it is. It's a very sensitive topic when we, I think, privileged enough to be able to sit here on Zoom and talk to each other when we talk about overpopulation. But when you walk into the very poorest of the communities, and we know through research there's a direct correlation between the number of children that people have and their social economic circumstances. And then you walk into those social economic circumstances and you try to tell people you are too many. And yeah. um, I, I think that the, the answer lie, the, the first step, but it's also too late, is the step of education. But education takes so long that it is just not simple that we think we can t turn it around in a, a month or two. It's not simple. You learn through time. So I think one of the, the areas that we really have to embark on is just a step beyond education, and that's awareness of conservation. And, and really use every method we have to create awareness amongst the young people, use the social media, use what we have in terms of mobile technology, and really rush at creating more and more and more awareness worldwide. And start using youth who have this awareness to share with others, but it's a mammoth task and a massive program. I don't wish or have the knowledge to think in terms of what illnesses can do and people who say COVID is only a, a Mickey Mouse to what is really coming. For me, the solution is not really in that because it's not in our hands. Um, and there are people who say whenever there's animal population, overpopulation, then you do find illnesses and things happening. That's not where my mind goes. I just know that every one of us, every single one of us should be not just a messenger as if you are wrong and we are right, but we should be the ones to pull others with love into this world of protection and conservation. And hopefully in the process, change will happen. But I am a little bit worried that too little too late. I'm not sure. To be honest, I'm not sure. Mm. Sorry for my answer. Thank you, Chris. Um, we have some more questions. We'll start with Janssen Davies. After that, we'll have Ruben de Kock, Galeo Sanz, and then Vindy Beck. So, Janssen Davies. Uh, thanks, uh, Rod. Chris, wonderful talk. Thank you very much. I think you shared with us uh, from the heart. As always, it was very meaningful. Thank you. Uh, full Thank marks. You. Thank you. Um, to uh, pick up on the last point, and just to bring a kind of counterpoint into this debate, you as the experienced change agent that you are, as I know you to be, um, you have said to me that conservation has failed. Conservation as we know it has failed. We in the kind of fringes and doing our little thing for conservation often come across this philosophical debate that what is the point of conserving, of giving you guys money to, to keep these animals alive for a period of time because in the fullness of time it's inevitable that they will become extinct or there'll be fewer of them or we'll lose that space. Whether this is for a specific species like our rhino, you know, we've been so focused on the rhino, and this is the debate that we often have. The people say, so what if the rhino goes? So what? It's just a, a kind of a mental construct that we are bound to that says we love the rhino and we want it to be there. Actually, nothing will change. Millions of species over the years have become extinct, and the world still carries on, and we only in our consciousness in a snapshot of time know the species of today. We are even unaware and insensitive to the millions who have perished. So therefore, is the rhino worth saving? I'm putting this as a rhetorical question. Whether that's that or whether it's a complete habitat, 
or whether it's a com the whole concept of biodiversity in the broad scheme. What would you say is the true sustainability of conservation as we know it? I would actually like Gus Mills to answer this question, but I'm going to start by quoting Gus Mills uh, when Gus Mills said that uh, what we know is only snapshots in the evolution of time. We actually know so little. Um, and uh, also want to say that we know that the ecosystem has got no agenda. The ecosystem is what it is and it's going to be what it is. And overpopulation will send the ecosystem, um, like Eagle said, like the pendulum of clock from the one side to the other side because nature will simply react to it. Why has conservation failed in my book? Um, carefully said with huge respect for people who are really trying their everything and organizations trying their everything. It's because I think that a lot of the money and the input that you have been donating has landed in the pockets of those who's doing the conservation and the NGOs who are doing the conservation. And when we are existing because of our organization and not existing because of the cause, we are failing. And if what we receive to do does not reach the ground, we are failing. The system that we have created is a system that doesn't work well. And um, like uh, um, I think uh, Dave Pepler said in one of his talks, personally, I'm not a person who say, I have to protect the rhino at all costs. I believe that we have to protect the ecosystem. And when we protect the ecosystems, what, whatever is within those ecosystems will grow and will carry on. But we cannot control, totally control the ecosystem. So I just know one thing, and that is if we don't do this, Janssen, and if we don't really to try to create biodiversity areas where people can have the sense of place, sense of beauty to restore their soul, we will cumulatively enhance the crisis the world is moving towards. We stand a chance, but not a big chance. But we cannot say we walk away. We simply cannot. If I and you walk away, Janssen, what then? What are you going to do with your life when you walk away? How are we changing anything if we walk away? We just cannot walk away. Even if it's, chances are very slim. We cannot walk away. We are doing it for people and suffering people. How do I walk away? Sorry, I don't have a proper answer, but that is how I feel about all this. Sorry, Anton Davies, you must keep Thank on giving you, money Anson. for conservation <laughs> because you're a conservationist. <laughs> um, um, we have uh, Galeo, Galeo Sands. And after that, we'll have Samantha, and then we'll have Bindi Beck Meyer and Neil Schuff. Great, thank you. Uh, greetings, everyone. And Chris, thank you for a really uh, beautifully uh, authentic presentation and one that, that brought some beautiful context for me as well. Um, I loved your, your piece on um, your point number three, key is uh, the key is relationship and bridge building. I'm currently working on an IUCN report where we've got 40 different authors looking at the, the intersection between uh, migration human and animal migration, conservation, or more specifically environmental change and conflict. And um, one of the things that we sort of just at the final stages of writing this report up, and one of the things we've identified is the critical, critical role that conservation has to play for all of us going forward into the future. Um, and in particular with, res with relation to your, your point number three, you know, you've got listed there, my job as an alternative conservationist is economist, teacher, bookkeeper, chef, et cetera, but it's also peacekeeper. It's, it's radical bridge builder. Um, it's radical agricultural practitioner. 
Um, so one of the things we've seen with looking through the lens of migration is the immense threat that environmental change, whether it's climate or other change, that's uh, coming to our environments is going to force most of us, especially in the conservation sector, to be much more conscious and aware of the dynamics of species movement. And how do we both plan for that movement, um, and especially when that movement happens very quickly or very suddenly due to natural disasters or other, you know, war or whatever other reasons, um, is how, how do we start managing for movement across parks, through parks, on the edges of parks, and especially when you've got large numbers of people potentially moving. And one of the things we're realizing is that the, the, the principles that we have been privileged to learn in conservation through our engagement with nature and ecosystems and ecosystem dynamics, that many of those principles are urgently going to be needed in the, the big, on the fringes of the big cities of the world where you've got these slums developing that you, you, you showed us in relation to population pressures. And in fact, what we're seeing through this report is one of the critical areas that require our uh, input as conservationists is the peri-urban areas around big cities where you've got a, a kind of lawlessness. There's not much good uh, implementation of, of legal procedures around uh, regional planning, et cetera. And yet you've got very marginalized communities living there. And oftentimes those peri-urban areas are sitting in wetlands or on exposed coastal places or in uh, marginal lands that don't have good water, et cetera. So what I'm just saying is I'm reflecting on, on your, your beautiful presentation and really enjoying it and uh, would be very keen to maybe get a little bit more involved with the work that you are doing and seeing how some of the solutions that we are identifying in this report can be shared amongst other conservation groups in helping us as a, as a broader conservation community to be better prepared for what is kind of essentially coming with the, with the immense environmental changes we're likely to see. And changes that we might not be able to, to map very easily and might not be able to identify very easily, but that require from within us uh, a deeper commitment, not necessarily to conservation per se, but to the great necessity of rebuilding, of re Vitali revitalizing nature and in particular revitalizing our relationship with our environment. What we've seen with the, with the migration research we've done now is that oftentimes some of the main drivers of migration are the breakdown of communities in their relationship to the place that they're in, where they're no longer able to feed themselves either through uh, various other drivers, but essentially it's a breakdown of relationship with place. And I think the, the role of us as conservationists is about rebuilding that relationship with place, wherever that place might be. Um, and so in a sense, as you say, it's this great, I loved your, your entire presentation, is this idea of uh, recreation um, and recreation in that same, same breath. Uh, I, you know, living through this COVID time and having myself just been through this COVID experience, um, the one thing that kept reaffirming itself for me was the radical need for all of us, no matter what field we're in, um, is we need to be even more creative. And one of the great places to, to enliven our creativity and how we look at our systems, our politics, our economics, et cetera, is to be re-inspired by what nature can really teach us and give us. So I just wanted to say thank you and share with you some Thanks. of the insights that we've been having. Thanks, Gaudio. The world needs a paradigm shift. We need a paradigm shift. Um, on your, I don't know if your and my screen look the same, but on my screen, on, the, on my right hand side, there's a guy called Neil Schuff who's got his hand up there. Uh, Neil Schuff is a landscape architect um, who works in the cities and a friend and a colleague working with us in Kotewa. And maybe he should also become part of this debate. Um, a debate that I have not thought of. So thanks for sharing that, much appreciated. Thanks, Rob. Hello, we'll be in touch. We'll be in touch. Um, Samantha, you're next. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chris, for, that, for sharing your story with us. And um, I'm really inspired by your journey. And, and I just wanted to say thank you for, for being so open and sharing that with us. And my question has to do with the part about inequality that you spoke about and alienation. Um, 
with, with specific regards to communities um, and involving communities within conservation, it seems in most parts, especially with the, within the African context, there's an alienation of these uh, communities which are often impoverished and marginalized and therefore to their, their involvement in conservation um, is minimal or, or non-existent at best. Um, are, are there ways to, to alleviate poverty that in, in your experience and over the years working with communities and seeing what's happening, is there a way to alleviate poverty within these communities and reconnect them with national parks? Um, for instance, the Kruger National Park. Uh, are, are there ways to reconnect these communities uh, in ways that they can, they feel um, the ownership, the connection with nature that you are, you are speaking of, to find healing in the processes. Um, and um, um, we're all aware of the apartheid uh, legacy that some of these national parks have. And often the communities feel alienated because of the, the historical, uh, the, the, the history of the place. And so I just wanted to hear your thoughts about uh, reconnecting communities, maybe even through conservation and working through poverty alleviation uh, in the same breath. Uh, what your thoughts are about that? Thank, thanks, Samantha. It's the good, the bad, and the ugly. Let me start with the bad. So many conservation organizations have to show that they are performing. And they need international money to keep on going. And I found that many organizations do a lot of window dressing. And I'm using a very simple and basic example where I have seen, I hope I have not done it. I, there's a chance that I could have done it. Where you would go with a gift, best would be a few whiskeys to the tribal leader and present a, a gift to the tribal leader. And then you do what you want to do by negotiating with that one person who gets the benefit and the rest don't. And then we portray it out there as if we are doing community work and it's purely window dressing. And to be frank, I've seen this a lot. I've seen a lot of community-based programs which are purely window dressing and not really touching the ground. That's the bad. Then the ugly is the fact that if you look at a park like Kruger and many other parks, I think the total population of people bordering Kruger parks about 1.2 million people. 64 communities, if I'm not mistaken, four languages, two international borders. It is also unrealistic to expect that the conservation authorities must carry this weight. It cannot just be their weight. So because conservation areas are very often in isolation in very rural areas where nothing is happening, when a conservation organization walk in there, then the demands come, we need schools, we need clinics, we need support, we need work. And in reality, a conservation organization can't carry those costs. And it's not totally the, the sole responsibility of the conservation organization. So I think that the beautiful for me is, and this is, sounds very philosophical, but communities know when you are genuine. They look through you. Those people have come, come a long way. And they've abused, been abused for many, many years. They look through you. And when you are involved in community work and you make no promises and you are serious and you mean what you want to do and you are open to them in terms of your own limitations, that takes you much further that you can actually think. Because the appreciation of your honesty and your openness and 
really trying goes a very, very, very long way. My ideal state would be that the conservation commerce that we talk about, tourism, is not just the only source of income because tourism is a fantastic source of income and may, plays a major role in terms of protecting these areas, but it cannot sustain it. My ideal position would be just now what Galio said, where you want to have sort of in the peri-urban areas, you want to have some conservation buffer as example. Why can't we have peri-urban areas around these places where jobs are created for people who are around protected areas, but they are viewed and seen that this is created by the protected area authorities? And why can't we have more industries on the side? Why can't we have more um, uh, farming areas and encourage that so that people can live in a situation where they can at least sustain themselves? And, um, and, and, and hopefully in that sense, don't have the need to go in and harvest which they've done for millions of years anyway, or millions, but many, many, many years. So I think we have to think out of the box. We have to think much bigger. And when we talk conservation commerce, don't just think tourism. Mm -hmm. Think much bigger than that to bring the, the industry into those areas, which brings other problems, but at least it creates a livelihood for these people. Conservation organizations and authorities cannot carry it on their own. We have to think. We need more economists. Chris, Chris Clarkson, we need more economists. Just saying that to put a little bit of pressure on you. Samantha, not simple. Not a simple thing. Thank but you, Samantha. Those who try hard. Thanks, Rod. Yeah. Samantha, the, the one thing I must say that the, the, the the, the underlying theme of all the talks we've had is, is communities uh, are, are the top point of the whole pyramid. If, they, if you don't get the communities behind you, everything's going to fail. In South Africa, these parks are all established in a, in a very bad time. So it's very hard to get the communities. We in Central Africa, we're in a position where we've got time to get the communities and we have to win them. Uh, if, if you look at what they're doing in Mozambique, the NIASA program, go and look at that on the LCA YouTube. They're getting the communities behind them. And what Steffi Platner said last week, nothing about us without us can be for us. And that's the community's philosophy. So if you don't involve the communities, you make decisions, they, they can't be for them. You have to involve them in every aspect. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Steffi. Thanks, uh, Samantha. Thanks, Rod. Um, Bindi, uh, who's it now? Is it Bindi now? Bindi. Bindi Good morning, Bindi. Bindi. <laughs> Hello, thank you, Chris. Um, I, I wanted to thank you for explaining kind of the obvious of where a conservationist looks towards others and looks to help others where the non-conservation is more intrinsic and just looking for their self and their personal growth and their money. And that explains why I do not like Facebook and to where the social media, all the, all the folks on Facebook are all me, me, me. And it's like, I can't stand that anymore. So I just want to thank you for explaining to me why I don't like it. <laughs> Thank you, Benny. Because That's why I'm not on Facebook either. <laughs> uh, great. Thank you. <laughs> Neil Schuff. The last, the last question. Hello, Neil. Last but not, not least. Um, <laughs> hi, Rod. Hi, everyone. Mon ami. Uh, thank you. That was a fantastic talk. I appreciated the personal level that, that the personal journey and story that you told us. 
Uh, I thought I knew you well as a friend and a colleague, but I just learned some more this evening, so I'm glad I tuned in. And um, I wanted to know from you, uh, with regards to uh, your first point, only people can do conservation. I wanted to know from you on the 20 countries that, that you referred to in the talk, uh, which countries showed the most political and institutional will for conservation? Who, who, who had the most will on, on, on looking at ecosystems and want to, to, to conserve ecosystems and actually community systems? Because as, as one knows, it's all hand in hand. Yeah, that's a difficult answer, a difficult question, Neil. Um, you know very well the political will within Kotewa for them to really do something. Um, the, there's a much stronger political will in the Republic of Congo than one would judge by some of the internal actions. And we must not confuse the people with the organization um, and I think the political will in Congo brought us how far we are in Congo because of the political will. And when you have that political will, you have to run with it. Ghana also did well, but Ghana gets caught up in a lot of um, uh, just bureaucracy. And uh, the, the top echelon's will is very often confused by the next layers. Ethiopia has got a very high will to achieve and to move forward. Um, of course, you cannot um, ignore Namibia uh, with their uh, wonderful conservation and protected areas and the, the contribution to GDP. So they also play a very big role there. Michele Menegan, there's change in the government in Tanzania, but uh, obviously Tanzania has, I think, um, a will to conserve, but the problem we often face in some of the countries are um, not Tanzania necessarily, but a lot of these countries is the fact that the politicians are not necessarily conservationists. And politicians do not always really understand the core of the issues and do we blame them for that. But there's a number of countries doing quite well uh, top of the list at the moment for me is Kotuwa because of what we have experienced and how they're ready to run and go with these. So, um, but now I'm skipping a few countries, so now I think I must go through the Africa map and I must cover myself by saying, what about this one or that one? <laughs> it's uh, speculative. Thank you, Neil. Yeah, I, I, and I just want to thank you again. I think uh, the time that we spent working together as friends and colleagues uh, I cannot accentuate more your wisdom and also your absolute energy. You have got so much fuel in that tank every morning when you get up. It actually blows my mind. I think you would give some 16-year-olds a serious run for their money. So thanks. Thanks well, very much. for. Thanks. Thanks, Neil. Madeline McDowell, she's got a hand up. Rod, is that okay? Can we take that last question? Um, okay, sorry, I missed that. Marilyn, where are you? You might just accept unmute. There she goes. Okay. Chris, I want to say um, there's not much more I can say that everybody else hasn't said because um, it was a really lovely, touching, moving, and uh, transparent, uh, that kind of human transparency that enables us to break down a lot of boundaries that exist. So I'm grateful for that. What I wanted to ask you was um, if we were to turn the, some of those models around and we were to think about nature as the conservationist, because I think nature has incredible uh, attributes that it would en that enable us to do the work that we do in wilderness, in nature. Uh, the most striking thing that I've heard 
on like um, in this kind of forum <laughs> is that you can speak about your soul, Chris. And I think it made me think about Eugene Murray and the soul of the white ant and how we speak so little about that part of reconnecting with nature from that soul level. And I think when that happens, it's very difficult to hurt anything in nature. That we automatically have that understanding that we are so interconnected that there's no separation actually. So I don't know what I'm really saying. I want to pay my respects to you and the work that you've done and ask a question about what is the role of nature as the conservationist in, in an environment like we have here? What you are saying, I think, Marilyn, is deeply f philosophical and one needs to get your head around it, but I love what you are saying because if you think about it, nature is the conservationist because nature is conserving man. And so the, the, the core conservationist is nature and we only part nature and um, a very small part of that nature. So nature is the conservationist. And I think uh, Ralston Free says in, in his book, Philosophy Gone Wild, um, that the, we, and I'm trying to find the correct words, that the ecosystemic processes is no longer or necessary about how man will survive in nature, it's rather how nature will survive with man. And nature is the bigger thing and we are the smaller one. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, um, we, are only, uh, we are only the guests and nature is, is, is the core and nature is the conservationist. We are kept by nature. We are not keeping nature. But we are arrogant enough to think we are keeping nature. Mm -hmm. And then comes a little virus called COVID. And look at the chaos. Yeah. So it's much better yeah. than I did, Chris. <laughs> we we will have to we will have to rethink, relook. Cosmos, very worried about you putting up your hand. Unmute. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, sir, Marilyn. Uh, Thank you, Chris. Can I talk? Or is it something? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Go ahead, guys. I'll just put you on mute any minute. <laughs> I just want to say, Chris, um, and everyone, and probably what I'm going to say is not helpful. I think, uh, Chris, as always, your talk is very inspirational and uplifting, and everyone really gets enthusiastic about your talks and and you are a person who does that and you've done it to me many many times and you're a great friend and i respect you greatly but one thing as you know and i've said it to you and i'm going to say it now and it's probably not helpful to anyone but we mustn't think that we are in charge in maybe five million years time i don't know how long you probably will not know that we as a species were on this earth. Everything we've done and created will have gone, but there will still be life. Nature will still be here. Um, and, you know, I think that that's probably the reality of it. Doesn't mean to say we can't try and we've got to keep doing things, but that, that, is, that is the reality as I see it. And as I say, it's not very helpful. Thank you for not being very helpful, Gus, but you were the one who pulled the carpet under my feet when you said to me, um, uh, the ecosystem has got no agenda. And yes, we are definitely not in charge. And uh, you are totally correct there. But I think, and I people, think for people is important. We I think we have one more question from uh, Pippa Hara. Thank you. Thank you, Rod. That, can't see. You can only see the top of your head, Pepper. Yeah. The, okay. The there are, uh, I can't move my screen. Um, thank you very much. It's been a, a, a wonderful session. Uh, I come from a paleontology background, so I, I 
I um, understand what Gus is saying, and I, I, I agree with that. Um, but, and also what Marilyn was saying, I can identify very, very closely with that. Because once we, once we, very, once we are in touch with, with nature, <clears throat> it's very difficult to, to harm it, you know, you don't want to harm it. But when, you, when you're talking to people who are developers and so on, very often the, the, the response is, but, but, there are lots of, but, but people need, need jobs, they need work, and the, and the economy, you know, the economy comes first, not the environment. So, and my response is, but without the environment, we can't exist. So, which is, you know, what, what we are saying. But um, well, I think one of, the, one of the biggest impacts we have is agriculture, is, is the way we do agriculture. And so food security is a huge issue. And, and if somehow we can transform the way we do agriculture so that it's more uh, conservation agriculture, and, and there, I mean, there is a worldwide movement to do that, but it needs to, you know, fast tracked. It needs to be fast tracked. It needs to really, 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 really speed up. And, and we've got to get rid of the pesticides and herbicides and things like that. And, and um, uh, as I understand it, Russia is leading the game there. I mean, they, they're big into permaculture. And if we can sustain ourselves with organically grown food, you know, good healthy food, these viruses wouldn't, we'd be much stronger and healthier and we'd, we'd be less susceptible to viruses and, and so on. Is that, um, is that making sense? So far, one of our board members, Jaku Lopsha, he was on earlier, I don't know if he's still here, but he keeps on maintaining, I'm just seeing if I see Jaku, but Jaku keeps on maintaining, saying you can no longer do conservation and not agriculture. Conservation and, and agriculture um, have it's got to go hand in hand. Otherwise, you're gonna you 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 will not win. You yeah. have to start thinking differently. And I I tend to agree that agriculture uh, is one of the big issues that we are facing, and um, also something that needs to um, be thought through. Mm. by us and and I'm, I'm saying it also carefully so um, we need more people to to do peripheral things that used to be peripheral within the puristic conservation content mm. 40 years ago this was would not even be said and these are were peripheral issues and now they are becoming the central issues mm. which is agriculture not conservation yeah so it, it is it's so it starts with the soil we've got to heal the exactly. soil exactly yeah. yeah i know how buffett always says we must stop talking about green processes we must talk about brown processes yeah. start with the soil what goes yeah. into the soil yeah exactly